Hey, what is up, everybody? Welcome to the Guilty as Charged podcast presented by the Chargers Podcast Network. My name is Steven, and I'm the host, as always, and joining me is my guy, Tyler. Tyler, what's up, man? How are you doing today? I'm doing great, man. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic as well. It's Combine Week, one of my favorite weeks of the NFL schedule. Uh, we're recording this on Wednesday. Uh, by the time this comes out, you guys will be listening to this, hopefully, or watching this on Friday. So we'll, we'll have some some testing numbers, some measurements. That all starts tomorrow uh, as we're recording this. So really excited to see that. We've heard from the edge rushers. We've heard from the linebackers, defensive linemen today at the Combine. We obviously heard from the general managers and head coaches yesterday from the media. We'll talk about uh, Mr. Joe Hortiz's press conference here in a minute. So uh, it's a lot of fun, man. Draft season is uh, ramping up in a big way. Yeah, the, the season ended and then we're right back in it. And I've got over 60 prospects graded. I'm stoked, man. Like, it's good stuff. I'm excited for the Underwear Olympics. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I've i been putting my, putting together my big board as we do every single year. And I like I always start with like the the first round grades, but now I'm like starting to solidify who I have in like that second second round range, things like that. So it's a uh, it's a lot of fun, and uh, I love talking about the draft. And free agency is right around the corner. We're uh, officially two weeks away from free agency as of recording this today. So uh, it's gonna it sneaks up on us every single year. There's all the the back channeling stuff that's happening at the combine this week is is gonna shape a lot of what happens in the next couple of weeks. So excited to uh, dive into all that. Uh, before we get started today, first and foremost, Tyler and I are, are fans of the team, just like you guys are. Uh, the opinions that we express and share on the show are not always reflective of the opinions of the Chargers organization themselves. We're very grateful to have this platform, uh, but just like you guys, we are fans at the end of the day. And that's why we're happy to uh, bring a, a fan perspective to the show and to the draft and everything like that. So, um, Specifically today, we're going to talk about Joe Ortiz's uh, press conference, and then we're going to highlight some uh, free agent targets that Mr. Joe Ortiz and company might be looking at, could be looking at, that uh, make some sense for where the Chargers are at financially. Um, but let's start with uh, Joe Ortiz's press conference here, Tyler. We'll spend a few minutes there, the bulk of our show on the free agency targets. But um, what's kind of your big takeaway from Joe Ortiz's press conference? He's had some time now to like sit back and watch the roster. You know, of course, he's not going to lay everything out. He's not going to tell us what he's going to do and all that stuff. But uh, he had some interesting comments. Was there one that kind of stood out most to you this week? Yeah, I love the comment about how the roster should never be where you want it. And they're going to find different points in the season to make the roster better. They're going to work daily to add pieces to the roster to improve it or to help the defense or the offense, whatever they need. You know, you're working constantly to get the roster to where you need it to be. So it's it's free agency, like he said, but it's also June free agency and preseason free agency and deadlines and things like that. I mean, this is, you know, this is a guy coming from a Ravens team that August of last year signed Jadavion Clowney and in September of last year signed Kyle Van Noy mm-hmm. and the previous year traded for uh, Roquan Smith at the deadline. And that's 130 pressures, I believe, 21 sacks, almost 100 stops, so many forced fumbles that they added to their roster because they were trying to do their best to be the best team they possibly could. And I think it's so much better to be proactive than it is to be reactive in the NFL. I mean, how many seasons have we watched where the Chargers, you know, relied on maybe the next guy or weren't so sure, but so they they waited to see how things would play out. And the season or the postseason even fizzled out because they just didn't have the right pieces to carry them into the postseason or further into the postseason. It's a very, very different organization, I think, moving forward with Hortiz, with Jim Harbaugh. You know, the Ravens, since 2011, had more than 50 trades, whether it's trading for picks or trading for players. Like, they are always going to be active, and I appreciate that so much. Like, this roster, you can never just be content with it. It's not a set-and-forget thing in the NFL. There's so much that goes on. And I love that Hortiz is like, yeah, we are going to prepare for this, and we're going to be as proactive as possible. Yeah, you mentioned the two pass rushers. I mean, he signed Arthur Millette and Ronald Darby, the two corners, uh, in July. And those guys ended up starting a lot of games for them. You know, I, I'm sure they would have loved to be in a situation where their starters play all 17 games, but those guys uh, were injured. And those uh, July free agency signings paid huge dividends for them. He had a, a similar quote, not in the press conference, but I believe it was on the NBC desk with uh, Chris Sims and, and Mike Florio, where 
he basically said, um, paraphrasing that, like, you can't be afraid to add depth when you need depth. Like, he's going to do everything he can to turn over the roster. Uh, you know, that quote specifically was about the fifth overall pick. But the mentality for him is is always just going to be like, I, I'm going to give Jim and the coaching staff um, everything that they need. And if that's a cornerback in July, I'm going to do it. If that's a pass rusher in August, I'm going to do it. If that's a pass rusher again in, in September, I'm going to do it. Like the the roster turnover, I think, is is going to be a, a different thing for us to watch. But in, in a good way, you know, I mean, like I look back at, you know, the 2022 season and how impactful Bryce Callahan and Morgan Fox were to that team and and the specific, you know, roles that they played. You know, Morgan Fox was a huge piece down the stretch that year after Austin Johnson and everybody got injured along the defensive line. He really had to raise his game. And Bryce Callahan, you know, has an injury history, but he stays healthy for the whole season that year and has an awesome season in the slot. So those those signings might seem small, you know, financially, they're certainly small when you're talking about comparing it to like the big all-star uh, kind of prospects. But, um, you know, they pay huge dividends across the roster. You never know what kind of impact those guys can, can make. Just going back to something you mentioned earlier, what did you make of the fifth overall pick comment about going best player available? You know, you're never one player away, but at that point, if you have the chance to take one of these elite players, you do it. There's been so much talk about the Chargers, and I think every Chargers fan has a mock draft where the Chargers are trading back once or seven times or whatever. <laughs> what did you make of that specific comment though, yeah. about fifth overall? Yeah, I think if you look at the Ravens draft history, and obviously it's it's always tough to correlate like 100%, but I mean, Joe Ortiz was there for... 20 years like the Ravens ideas are like that's how Joe's going to operate and like I think if, if they believe that one of the players at number five is a blue chip player like can't miss prospect I think they'll stick and pick that player but if Marvin Harrison Jr. let's say is the only can't miss player on their board and he's gone I believe that they are going to try and trade back because I like Joe Ortiz highlighted the need for depth at every single interview he did yesterday. So I think in an ideal world, in a, an ideal world for the chargers, I think that the trade back is, is kind of number one priority on their boards, unless they can get a guy who they think is blue chip. And maybe that's Malik neighbors. Maybe that's Joe Alt. Maybe that's Oli Fushano. We don't really know their board. I think we kind of tend to agree. It's, it's Harrison or, or neighbors or maybe Odunze. But um, I, I think that the desire to trade back is, is very real in my opinion. Yeah, I would agree. And I certainly don't expect Hortiz to go out and say, hey, here's our plan. This is what we're doing. Um, yeah. I just was curious what you thought, because that, that did make me raise an eyebrow for a bit. Uh, Stephen, what was your big takeaway from this presser? Yeah, I think um, his comment where he was asked specifically about the depth of the offensive line class and pivoted it to the depth of the wide receiver class is certainly notable. Um, I, I think we just we talked about just briefly mentioning the the top of the wide receiver class this year is is outstanding, but like I, I'm like 16 receivers deep and I'm like man I really like this player you know um, and it, there's just this the depth of talent that you can get at wide receiver in the second and third rounds it, it's great for the Chargers obviously I'm on board with taking a wide receiver in the first round with one of those guys but you know you look at um, this group of second and third round wide receivers is is incredibly deep. And that includes guys that Jim Harbaugh is very familiar with, like a Roman Wilson type or like a Ricky Pearsall or Xavier Worthy, Troy Franklin, like the list goes on and on. I know a lot of people like Xavier Leggett from South Carolina, but it, it's it's <laughs> it's very real where you see these guys like a Tank Dell, like a Puka Nakua, you know, and there's been other third, fourth, fifth round guys who come in and make strong impacts. Obviously, Cooper Cup was the same way a few years ago. It's just kind of the nature of the college game where it's like, yes, I would love to have a blue chip talent. But at the end of the day, there's so many different options out there in this specific class where you have a great blue chip class. You have a, a great second tier class and really solid depth into into day three, I think, too. Yeah, so as it turns out, Trevor Sikama, who covers the draft for a living 365 days a year, was right. And that it is a very deep wide receiver class that could rival last year's. Uh, he said that there probably won't be another Puka Nakua, certainly not a Puka Nakua in, on day yeah. three. Like, if you're going to find someone, if it's Marvin Harrison Jr., great, but that's Marvin Harrison Jr. Unlikely to find another guy on day three that can do that. But it is a very, very deep class. And I'm glad that that is at least 
in his mind. The same with offensive line, of course, but at least with wide receiver as well, because you mentioned Nakua, you mentioned Tank Dell, Josh Downs, Jaden Reed. Uh, there were so many guys throughout last year's draft that contributed so much that for almost every team that took a receiver in the first round or maybe even in the second round, you could argue that they went too early, that maybe mm -hmm. they could feel some regret because, oh man, we could have had Joey Porter Jr. and Jaden Reed instead, or we could have had Brian Branch and, and Tank Dell or whatever. Any team in those first two rounds could have maybe felt that way because the depth of the class was so good and it was so strong. I mean, it's not like, I forget who was discussing this. It might've been Joe Ortiz, but it's not like the wide receivers previously where they get, you know, 20, 30 targets. And that's kind of it, like from decades ago. Now these guys are getting a hundred targets, you know, 75 catches. There's so much to go off of. It's so much more involved. So yeah, I'm curious to see who the risers are at the combine this week because it's a very deep class. Yeah. And, and you know, at wide receiver specifically, I, I'm curious if maybe the Chargers, maybe not, but I'm curious if more teams kind of follow what the Green Bay Packers have done the last two years where they passed on like a first round wide receiver, but then they took one in the second round and Christian Watson. Then they took another one in the fourth round, Romeo Dobbs. Then this past year, they did it again. I think it was a fourth and a fifth with Jaden Reed and Dontavian Wicks. Like, I'm curious with the amount of wide receiver talent that there is, if teams are like, hey, like, maybe we don't need a first round talent. Maybe we just need a couple on day three and we'll see kind of what happens, you know, cream rises to the top. So, uh, you know, obviously the Packers had the youngest offense in the league and they were still a top 10 unit. So um, there's a blueprint gets thrown around a lot as kind of like a catchphrase, but uh, that to me from like a philosophy standpoint and, and personnel department is curious to see if we might te see teams doing that more often. I guess it really depends. If you have LaFleur or if you have Andy Reid calling <laughs> sure. plays, that it's a lot a easier. Lot. If you, you can you can make any receiver work. I mean, Bo Melton was drafted or undrafted free agent by the Seahawks. Yeah. Didn't really do much. Went to the Packers. No, look, we have we have LaFleur as the coach now in calling plays. Hey, I'm productive out of nowhere. Um, don't know that every team can get that. I don't even know if the Chargers can really do that. Sure. But I would understand if you're confident in your play calling and how you scheme things open. And if you're basically a bulletproof kind of play caller, yeah, I could see why that would be the new model. Not that you avoid receiver altogether in the first round. If the guy's there, the guy's there. But you could wait because these classes are just getting better and better. Yeah, and I, like, I do think that there is something to be said about if you think there's a blue chip guy, you take that and you kind of figure out other ways. Like everybody, and I think we are included in this, want to see the Chargers maximize their draft weekend by trading for, for picks and acquiring more picks. Well... You can do that in round two. You can trade down in round two. You can trade down in round three. And the Ravens have done that pretty successfully throughout the time that Joe Ortiz was there. So, you know, if they stick and pick at five, maybe they trade down from 37 to 50 or something like that in the second round and, and get like another day three pick or something like that. So uh, I feel pretty confident that Joe's going to play the board. The Chargers are not going to make all seven of their original picks at those spots. I think they'll they'll have some movement and uh, potentially getting a another pick from you know, Drew Tranquil's contract and, and the comp pick formula. Maybe there's a player trade, things like that. So Joe's going to play the board. I feel pretty confident about that. Yeah, as am I. In, in Harbaugh, we trust. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, Tyler, any other thoughts about uh, the press conference media tour from Joe Ortiz? Or do you want to dive into the free agency talk here? Just one quick thing. And that's that he said he will not stand for chargering. And he, he mentioned that there are other teams that do this. Like we just saw the Lions not have a great NFC championship game. So it's not like the Chargers are the only team to to Charger, if you will. But it is a label that follows them. And I appreciate that Joe Hortiz mentioned that we will not stand for that. And I guess, of course, he would. What else is he going to say? Yeah. But I appreciate him acknowledging that and, and saying that, that is, this is a problem. And it's a problem that you know is, is organizational or was organizational. And it's something that I think sits with us fans a lot this idea of chargering i remember being at qualcomm and raiders fans would be singing you know san diego super chokers and, and all that sort of stuff like it follows us as fans too and we want to feel like hey we're winners too and we support a, a winning team and i think with with harbaugh with hortiz um everybody everybody from this you know, all-star staff i think they're going to get past that i hope they do but i at least appreciate him saying hey we're not going to stand for that anymore yeah yeah, I think that's that. That was uh, an interesting question. Um, I, I think uh, Justin Herbert was asked about that too in a different interview. Um, the guys outside, I mean, the guys in the locker room are just going to say like, "I don't know what that is," but like, you know, we're we're not going to stand for that kind of thing. So, um, it is interesting. 
All right, so uh, one of the things Joe did talk about was the uh, free agency avenues. He mentioned that they were going to be aggressive, but they were going to be smart and creatively aggressive, uh, not necessarily going out and shopping for any big fish here. Charters, even with the the cap increase, are still uh, $22 million in the red uh, before uh, the start of the new league year in a couple weeks here. So Tyler and I have prepared a list of four players each. We might mention a couple others here, but uh, of players who are projected to make less $10 million or less average per year, according to uh, Mr. Brad Spielberger's free agency ranking. And Brad does not miss. He's the best in the business. So um, we're going to be talking about that kind of group of free agents where, you know, you're you're talking about kind of the mid-level guys. If you go into the free agency rankings of your favorite analysts, they're probably not in the top 50. They're probably closer to like 60, 70, 100. 150 there's one that's not even on the list for me today um but that's that's the kind of group that we are starting with and i think um i'll start us off here with i you know i think my my top priority if i am putting my joe Ortiz cap on it is solidifying the offensive line in free agency and not necessarily taking that right tackle need away but my goal in free agency is to add somebody who can play multiple spots. I know a lot of our Chargers fans have pegged, you know, Mike Unwenu from the Patriots as that guy. He's probably a little bit outside of this price range. Um, so for me, I'm looking at offensive linemen who can play multiple spots, whether that's center and guard, whether that's bolt guard spots, tackle guard, whatever the case may be. I'm trying to find some versatility to give me some flexibility. A guy that could play uh, center, if the rookie, you know, draft board doesn't fall their way, would be huge for this team, you know, have the competition across multiple spots is kind of the idea here. Uh, so Graham Glasgow is my choice. A former Michigan man. He was not recruited by Jim Harbaugh. He was already there when Jim Harbaugh was hired, um, but he finished his career under Jim Harbaugh at Michigan. Um, this is a guy who has over 1,200 career snaps at left guard, over 2,600 career snaps at center, and over 3,200 snaps at right guard. So he can play all three spots along the interior. I think it gives the Chargers – a ton of flexibility. This last year specifically, he played at a very high level at right guard for the Detroit Lions. He was 16th out of 79 in pro football focuses, uh, wins above replacement metric, which is very good for a, a guard in that uh, in that standing. The pass blocking efficiency rating is, is not at that level. It, it was 59th out of 83 guards this past season. But from a run blocking standpoint, he was fifth out of of eighty three qualified guards. So this is this is a taller, you know, bigger physical guard center kind of guy who really fits what the Ravens have had traditionally in like a Bradley Bozeman type of player and like a Kevin Zeitler type of player. And he's not going to break the bank. And so you're looking at a contract. Maybe it's two years, fourteen million dollars. I think Brad uh, specifically has him at uh seven million dollars per year so in that in that six to eight million dollar per year range for a guy who could start at center for this team he could start at right guard for this team um worst case scenario for him is that you he's your swing into your offensive lineman can play all three spots so i just i want that versatility i want that flexibility and I think Graham Glasgow, uh, the eight-year veteran, can bring that. Yeah, I think that's my charge. favorite of the picks that are projected to, or at least they could play center for the Chargers. The Chargers absolutely need to go into this mm -hmm. draft with a guy they feel comfortable starting for the entire season for them, should they miss out on a player on a center that they like. And I, I really do like Glasgow quite a bit, especially in the run blocking, as you mentioned. And I think that it, it's a perfect fit for what the Chargers, where the Chargers are at. Um, obviously, they've had some really good luck with centers recently with Pouncey and then Lindsley. They have brought these guys in and both have been very good. Haven't had you know lengthy careers with the Chargers. It's not like they played with the Chargers for a, a decade. But I think that's perfect because there are a lot of really good center or interior offensive lineman prospects in this class. And Glasgow, whether it's you know mm -hmm. just this year or two years, can really help bridge between you know what the Chargers probably need right now, what Herbert really needs right now, to who their center of the future is eventually going to be. And I think you could take in this regard a Hunter Norzad from Penn State, who I really like, or a Bo Limmer from Arkansas in the fourth round, fifth round. And if those guys are ready to play right away, great. Then Glasgow can play guard for you. If they're not, then Glasgow is your starting center for the year. So I, I, I like that one. I think it gives the Chargers a lot of flexibility 
Uh, who's your uh, top one that you want to bring Steven, up? Steven, I can't believe I'm doing this because I didn't think I was going to bring this name up. I am going to bring up Derrick Henry, the running back for the Titans, and he's expensive. Um, right. We said $10 million or less, and the projection is right at $10 million, <laughs> so I get to use this name. That's why you wanted to include the or less. I, I see <laughs> yes, you. I, I, I get um, it. I get what I want. Um, the player pitch is very simple. It was eighth in <laughs> yards after contact per attempt, sixth yeah. in breakaway rate fourth and in, in missed tackles forced um second in, in pff war so this is a very good running back this is a very good player as is um, but why an expensive older running back i genuinely believe and joe horty's mentioned as much in his presser that running backs have quite a bit of value and they certainly have value in this offense um, with jim harbaugh what he wants to do with what greg roman wants to do i do believe absolutely that running back has value and there, there are several other options i bring up derrick henry but there are plenty of other ones Edwards, um, Josh Jacobs, Zach Moss, etc. Um, those are all really good names too. But I think for this one with Derrick Henry, I wanted to bring it up for a few reasons um, that I'll get into other than the fact that he is a good player. Um, one, the 49ers did give Frank Gore a three-year $20 million contract back in 2011, and he was age 28 at that time. Uh, Derrick Henry will be 29. So it's not like Jim Harbaugh has not done this before. And heck, um, Gore went to the Jets to finish his career where Chad Alexander, the Chargers' new assistant general manager, was there as a director of player personnel. I'm not saying they're getting Frank Gore, but I'm saying like there is a bit of comfort (laughs) with A, giving money to a player who's 28, 29, and B, a running running back back. who is, you know, older. Like they will go out and do this. Granted, Frank Gore at that time versus Derrick Henry now, different uh, mileage, different carry totals, but still. But the Ravens have have gone out of their way previously, and of course, Jordy Ortiz was there, to go get a uh, Le'Veon Bell, a Melvin Gordon, a Dalvin Cook. Again, not as a $10 million a year starter by any means, but again, they are comfortable working in that age range and trying to find backs to keep the, the room going. Um, but the reason I'm really bringing this up at all is that there are now some reports circulating that last year there was a deal in place or very close to a deal in place to send Derek Henry from the Titans to the Ravens. Why did it fall through? I have no idea. But Joel Hurtiz was with the Ravens, and so I don't know how involved he was with that. But if the reports are believed to be true, and I I don't know if I'd say I believe them, we'll never really know. But if we believe those reports to be true, then there was some interest. So I think that based on history, based on what they want to do, what Greg Roman wants to do, potentially that trade having happened last year, and just the fact that Greg Roman and this rushing attack, they need somebody like this, I think. I did want to bring up Derrick Henry, and I wasn't going to before, but after a while, the more I looked into it, I felt like I kind of needed to. Yeah, there's obviously a lot of uh, love out there, or I guess desire for the Chargers to go out and sign uh, an expensive running back. You know, uh, Rich Eisen went on his show yesterday, I believe, maybe Monday, and uh, was advocating for the Chargers to sign Saquon Barkley. Um, I think their Chargers are, or were current, were at one point the favorites to sign Josh Jacobs in free agency. So, like, a lot of people think the Chargers are going to sign an expensive free agent running back. I, I, I think Derrick Henry would probably be my choice of the expensive running backs. Um, Saquon's had an injury history. You know, he's had a ton of wear and tear on his body, and the explosive numbers are still there. But the down to down efficiency numbers last year and even the year before that were were not great. Uh, you look at Josh Jacobs, who led the league in rushing in 2022. The efficiency numbers were not very good last year, um, and the explosive numbers were even worse. And a lot of that could be said, you know, they went from dealing with like, a, you know, Derek Carr quarterback and to a, an Aiden O'Connell type quarterback. The offense kind of deteriorated. deteriorated. Um, that certainly plays a factor. But if you look at Derek Henry, the Titans offensive line last year, if you just pulled everybody and said, hey, who has the worst offensive line in the league? I think the Titans would have won that poll. And Derrick Henry still produced at a really high level, uh, rushing yards over expectation, yards after contact, all the stuff that you highlighted. So I think of the expensive type of backs, Derrick Henry would be my choice. How interested he would be in kind of choosing a, a soft reset for the Chargers as opposed to going to the Ravens or, or another team who is currently a, a Super Bowl contender remains to be seen, but I, I definitely can understand why anybody would choose Derek. Yeah, Henry so for this plenty season. of running backs. I, I think that there is that argument that Joe Hortiz, or at least the Ravens in general, I know he's not the GM, have not paid running backs under Lamar's contract. At the same time, I feel like Lamar also could give you a thousand rushing yards 
or Justin Herbert is not giving yeah, you that. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> so I think that you got to kind of meet in the middle. Like Herbert's not going to go get a thousand yards rushing next year. I'm pretty sure but I wouldn't put it past him. Um, so you got to find something to kind of meet you in the middle there for the, for the rushing attack. Yeah, I, I think we ultimately will see the Chargers add a veteran running back. I think the the position room just needs that that kind of juice and you need a, a you need that stability. You can't go into the draft with Isaiah Spiller and Elijah Dotson on on under contract. Like you 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 need to add somebody to the room. Um so I'm gonna go down a few tiers. Um and this is definitely a character caricature of myself i went to the school i actually had a class in college with this individual and that is mr zach moss and i know people are kind of tired of me talking about utah i only talk about utah when it's relevant and in this instance it is relevant you look at zach moss and what he did with the colts and at one point during the season when jonathan taylor was dealing with his injury zach moss was the leading rusher in the entire nfl uh with Gardner Minshew as his quarterback um, you look at his season as a whole among 51 running backs with at least 90 attempts. Zach Moss was fifth in rushing yards over expectation per attempt. He was 25th in total missed tackles forced. He was 28th in runs of 10 plus yards. He was 20th in breakaway percentage and he was 24th in first downs created. That, there's a lot of value in the efficiency of a Zach Moss type of running back. And he showed what he could do for the for the Colts in, in spot duty, in full-time starter duty. And that's just the kind of reliability that I think the Chargers running game needs. I don't think he's the type of running back to carry the ball 20 times every single game for 17 weeks. Uh, obviously, I know him very well. He gets uh, he gets these little uh, bumps and bruises along the way pretty much every season. He misses a game or here, game or two here or there quite often. So he's not like a workhorse back like Derrick Henry. But he can come in and stabilize your running back room. He can come in and add some efficiency um, you know, you do have to add other running backs to his room, but you know, you get Derrick Henry for one year, $10 million type deal, let's say, and you can get Zach Moss for two years and $7 million total. So you're talking about a, a much cheaper type of running back. Who's not your RB one. Maybe he's more of your one a this year and just kind of allows you to take some lumps this year, stabilize the position, uh, giving you some, some real reliability and capability at the spot for, the short term. Yeah, as, as we just discussed, the Ravens never paid uh, running back a ton of money while under this contract, but they've always done a really good job of having like RB1 to RB4 plus their fullback be really, really good, really, really strong. So at any point, like, okay, you lose a player, yeah. J.K. Dobbins goes down, for example, and you still have a really good rushing attack. Again, you know, Lamar helps with that quite a bit, but they've always managed to keep a nice group there. So Zach Moss leading that, I think, would be fantastic. This draft class doesn't seem like it has any round one guys. And frankly, like round two even feels rich for a lot of these guys because some of the guys that could be there got hurt and they're recovering from injuries yeah. or they're not even you know running this weekend um, for various reasons. So it's not like a great class early, but later on that like round three to five range really do like a lot of these guys. So pairing Zach Moss with one of those guys with Spiller and Dotson feels like a nice, really nice one through four running back room. I think that, again, the Chargers should draft a running back this year. And, you know, I, I, like Tyler is mentioning here, I, I think Jonathan Brooks or Trey Benson type, like they could be that guy in the second round. But both of them have some knee issues that I would definitely want to get some clarity on. Uh, obviously, Jonathan Brooks tore his ACL this past season. We don't know when he's going to be ready. So, you know, whoever, whatever veteran they sign, like you're going to need a, a young running back to be able to come in after him. I mean, the Titans last year, I think, did it right with adding Tajay Spears. So that's that's the kind of thing you're trying to look for. You're you're signing a Zach Moss. Maybe you're doing even cheaper than that. And you're signing a Gus Edwards type. Um, and then you're drafting kind of a faster, more explosive type, I think, is is probably the approach that I'm leaning towards. If you draft Derek, if you sign Derek Henry. The running back need probably goes down a few rounds. Maybe that becomes like a six round need instead of a fourth round need. Um, but either way, like the, the Chargers are going to run the football in 2024. And as long as Jim Harbaugh is the coach and they need multiple running backs, it's not just like sign yeah, one. Guy I agree. Uh, next up for me, I'll go with a defensive tackle. And you have one that I do like quite a bit more to discuss later, but I'll go with a different one. And that is me just thinking about comp picks here and reclamation projects and coaching. And that is Javon Kinlaw, the defensive tackle for the 49ers, who mm -hmm. was a former 14th overall pick. A lot of talent, 
it has really not panned out so far. Although he did have a much better final season with the 49ers, um, 31 pressures, 15 run stops, um, I believe four sacks or whatever it was. He's only projected to get five and a half, only projected to get five and a half million dollars a year. I say that as a teacher who just definitely not does not make that much money. Um, but if, if you're Jim Harbaugh, <laughs> if you're Jesse Minter, if you're Mike Elston, if you're Ben Herbert, if you believe that you are the all star staff that you are and that you can maximize players, particularly on defense, I think you go out and you try to take a chance on some of these quote unquote projects. Um, not that these guys were projects, but we talked about Clowney. We talked about Van Noy. These guys came into this defensive system and had the best years of their careers. And I think that this is potentially a defensive system that can do that for uh, Kinlaw. So you find a way to get the former 14th overall pick, who was kind of ascending this last year anyway. You get him to really have another really good season, like maybe even a great season. And now you're talking about being able to flip, you know, he goes and gets a nice contract elsewhere and you get a future comp pick for that. They did it with uh, Matthew Judon or Matt Judon. They did it with Yannick Ngakwe. They got fourth round picks, comp picks for those guys. Mm. Um, again, not the most exciting thing ever, but at minimum, you get a player who fits at least like the size profile where we're trying to start looking for defensive tackles who sure. are that 300 plus pound um, solid player there. He is a bit more of a rusher than a run defender. So I could see why the Chargers would hesitate there. But again, if you believe in who are you are as a staff, I'd like to see the Chargers start going after players who didn't quite hit yet and then getting those players and then maximizing them. So it's either A, a benefit to their team or B, a benefit to their team long term because, hey, we got a comp pick for that player. So Kinlaw, there are other defensive tackles. I like the one that you're going to mention. Very different in terms of what they bring to a team. But I'd like to see the Chargers yeah. for you know many different players go try to work the comp picks that way. Yeah, I think that's um, that's an element that I, I wish was a, a greater piece of the Chargers plan previously because I think you know a lot of these guys like they're they didn't work out for certain reasons, right? And, and maybe it doesn't work out for the Chargers, but it's about maximizing your value and being able to give yourself extra opportunities in ways that you might have not previously done. I mean, the 49ers in in other position groups have done that same thing uh, along the defensive line, obviously with Chris Kasurik, who is probably the best defensive line coach in the league. So you, they can take that kind of risk. Um, but yeah, like when we made this plan, like my, I guess my catchphrase for like my, my, my group was going to be like, where's the beef? Like, where's like, this is Wendy's like, I need some beef up the middle. And so Graham Glasgow was going to be the first guy. Ajon Robinson was going to be the second guy. You brought up Derrick Henry, so natural transition to Zach Moss. But uh, Ajon Robinson is my other player here for where's the beef. Uh, this is an a interior defensive lineman for formerly of the New York Giants. And he's not been necessarily tied to, the, to this current regime. But the Giants had Wink Martindale, who Jesse Minter learned under for quite some time. Um, a Sean Robinson has also played with the Los Angeles Rams, which was previously coordinated by Brandon Staley, who there is some overlap as we learned from Cody Alexander between what the defensive line room specifically is required of them in Brandon Staley's defense to Jesse Minter's defense. And so there, I, I think this is a world where a Sean Robinson would come in with a strong grasp of the scheme. Um, he is a very large human being, and I was surprised to learn that he was still only 28 years old. I feel like he's been in the league forever, uh, but that's what happens when you get drafted when you're like 20 uh, from Alabama. Uh, but you look at the numbers here. He was uh, among 76 interior defensive linemen with 50% of their team's run defense snaps. So this is this is the run defense guys. Ashawn Robinson was third in total run stops with 36 and first in run stop percentage with 14.1%. He was 27th in average depth of tackle in, in terms of average depth of tackle for from PFF. Um, and he's only going to cost you, according to Brad, $6 million per year. And, and again, the Chargers are in a space where they can't really afford to go big fish hunting. But let's get some competency, competency at these positions where they're lacking. And for me, like into your offensive line, defensive tackle, running back, like that's really what I'm seeking in free agency. This is how you get creative and, and aggressive in free agency without having uh, the resources to do so. Is let's just go get a guy who can stabilize the floor of this position group, play a specific role for us. We know the Chargers are going to prioritize like big run stuffing defensive tackles under Jesse Minter. 
A. Sean Robinson, I think, is a, is yeah, a great I, choice. I agree. With so much of watching the, more specifically, Michigan, because now I've watched, I think, eight Michigan defensive prospects in this upcoming class. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's so many. I mean, there's all, 18 yeah, of them at the, the combine, combine. And they're all really good. Like, they're all pretty darn good, which is pretty <laughs> cool that the Chargers yeah. might inherit a lot of that development. But it was so apparent watching the defense for Jesse Minter that, like, defensive tackle and the way these guys play is so important. And they have to be, you know, the guys behind them, the linebackers behind them, or maybe the nickel blitz. Like, those are the guys that end up making the play. So they blitz and they get a QB hit or a pressure or tackle for loss or whatever it is. But those guys up front have to do their jobs. So the guys behind them go and go ahead and and make those big splash plays. So definitely wanted to go with Robinson. You stole him, but it was a good call. <laughs> no, all good. Sorry about that one, Tyler. But uh, like, th- I think these are the kind of the rooms that we're talking about so, pursuing in free agency for the Chargers. A lot of a lot of beef up front, depth. So I, I'm I'm curious to see ultimately what the the uh, process is here. But Tyler, you have. Uh, one other one, and then maybe we get to some extras, extra fun ones at the right, end. You don't get to some year? of your ones. I'm going to steal them, but I'm going to stick with mine because I really like yours. But I'll stick with mine. Okay. And it's a player that I hope never sees the field, but the Chargers absolutely need a backup quarterback. So I am going with Tyrod Taylor in this particular case. Um, there's certainly familiarity there, right? There's a, you know, what played for the Chargers, obviously, but also with Greg Roman and was drafted by the Ravens and Joe Ortiz. And with Andy Bischoff, the Chargers' new run game coordinator slash tight ends coach. But like the honest truth is, we've seen Justin Herbert go down with some pretty serious injuries. Some he's he's fought through and stayed in the game and, and played through. Some have ended his season, like this past one. And the Chargers, you know, do I think that this backup quarterback or any backup quarterback is going to carry them through the postseason into a Super Bowl this year? Like, no. But the Chargers need to give themselves a fighting chance. And we just talked about you know, Hortiz and how he wants to make sure we're looking at every possible advantage we can and being prepared and, and, you know, end of the season or beginning of the season, uh, preseason, you name it. Like we're going to go find players to make sure we're ready in case something happens. And a quarterback is big insurance for that. Obviously a backup quarterback like Tyrod Taylor. Look, am I expecting 400 yards a game? No, but the Chargers need someone who can come in, run this offense, literally run in this offense too. I think Tyrod Taylor brings that. So it's a very inexpensive contract. Again, I hope he never sees the field. That is the hope uh, for every NFL team, every NFL fan. They don't want to see the backup quarterback on the field unless it's a 40-point blowout, which, hey, I'll take. Um, But they need somebody. They really do need a backup quarterback. It's not the most intriguing, exciting free agent, you know, ad by any means, but it's insurance and it's important. And unfortunately, we've seen Herbert go down a couple of times the last few seasons. Yeah, I think there, there's also extra value here in, in Tyrod Taylor knows how Greg Roman wants to run the offense. And not to say that Justin Herbert needs that extra help, but it, it's always helpful. Like the, the backup quarterback position, if you are doing it right, is essentially like another quarterback coach. And so it's it's an extra set of eyes. Obviously, we know that Justin and Easton Stick are, are very close and uh, you know I wouldn't rule that return out either. Um, but you're going to want to prioritize somebody who can run and, and Greg Roman can have that kind of stabilized floor with the quarterback run game, if anything happens. So whether it's stick or Tyrod or, or somebody else who can run somebody who's familiar with the kind of offense that they want to run. I think that's where you're kind of looking for a backup quarterback. And I think, you know, Max Duggan, they drafted in the seventh round. He was cut several times. I'd be pretty surprised if they entered the season with him as QB two. Like, I think they are going to make some kind of, transaction there whether that's another you know late round draft pick or veteran or something like that we'll see um but i I think they're going to want some competition for that spot maybe it's somebody like tyro that's obviously kind of the higher end of competition but i would not be surprised at all if they uh yeah and if it ends up being tyler huntley i will leave you alone for 45 minutes on the podcast while you just you just talk about your utah guys (laughs) Hey, just give me all the Utah guys. I mean, it's worked out well for the Chargers in the past, uh, but uh, it is what it is. Um, all right, last one here for me. Uh, I, I I need the Chargers to add a tight end. Uh, a good blocking tight end um, is what I desire from free agency. I don't necessarily need um, that guy to be a great receiver, but you know, I, I every time I turned on the Chargers tape, I just I needed that good blocking tight end. And Jim Harbaugh and Greg Roman need that good blocking tight end. They've always had one wherever they're at. Um, so there's, there's a few different places that I think they could look. Um, I think Brad mentioned Adam Troutman as, as a potential fit for the Broncos. 
That's what I'm not opposed to. Um, but the the Chargers did hire uh, Sanjay Lal from the Seattle Seahawks, and the Seahawks tight end room was my favorite tight end room to watch every single time I watched it. Um, they could choose Noah Fant from that room if they wanted to. Uh, but Colby Parkinson, I think, is going to be very, very cheap. He's a fantastic run blocker. Uh, according to PFF's metrics, how much stock you put into those, you know, is whatever it is. But out of uh, tight ends with at least 20% of their respective teams run blocking snaps, uh, Colby Parkinson ranked eighth out of 83 qualified tight ends. And specifically, he was 21st in gap power runs. So the the Seattle Seahawks ran a lot of outside zone. Shane Waldron's comes from that Sean McVay tree. But when they would go to the gap and power stuff, it was often uh, Colby Parkinson who was their tight end of choice as a blocker. Um, so he's a guy who like I would definitely trust as – setting the edge, cutting out the backside. You know, he's he's a, a quality pass protector as well. Um, and he went to Stanford. He did not he did not play for Stanford when Jim Harbaugh was there, but he probably was recruited by Jim Harbaugh in some extent, uh, depending on the timeline there. Um, but I, I think there's a lot of parallel there in terms of like what Stanford is obviously valued at tight ends, even with David Shaw and, you know, Jim Harbaugh before him. And it, I just think he fits perfectly what this, this regime would look for. There are other tight ends out there, but Kobe Parkinson was was very rarely used in the passing game. I think there is some more upside there. This is kind of a, a low-cost, high-reward chance at tight end for me. Uh, loyal listeners of the show know I've wanted Kobe Parkinson on the Chargers for years. Uh, the last two trade deadlines, I mentioned him as a trade uh, trade target because the the Seahawks have, have had an awesome tight end room. So um, Kobe Parkinson would be a great choice for blocking tight end. I just need somebody to come in here and be competent, and uh, I've always had a thing for Parkinson's. Yeah, so we, we've been discussing Colby Parkinson since I feel like for 27 years at this point. <laughs> like my entire life, I feel like I've just been talking about Colby Parkinson. Like, <laughs> let's trade for him, or or it's Cole Komet. But now they don't cost him a pick. They just probably cost. He just probably cost. There like you go. Just two million dollars. Whoever's got that, feel free to spend it. Um, no, <laughs> this tight end class. I have not watched many tight ends. I don't have a lot of enthusiasm to watch this tight end class outside of Brock Bowers. But from those that I've watched and from everything you hear, even just looking at the consensus board, it's not a great class for tight ends. It is not like last year's class where I feel like every other pick was a good tight end. It's not really a great class. And even then, even if you like some of these tight ends, they're not all great blocking tight ends. You know, Sanders, I think is a pretty solid tight end prospect it's not really the same kind of blocker that colby parkinson is so i think the chargers adding a tight end at any point in free agency would be smart for them just have that in your back pocket or as your starter or whoever just knowing that you can go into the draft and not don't feel like you have to reach for a tight end or, or get a tight end that doesn't really fit because you didn't get one in free agency yeah um, okay, Tyler, did you have another sure. one? Sure. Why don't I up? just keep with positions that are typically considered um, not the premium positions? Let me go with linebacker, because uh, why not? I went with an expensive running back, and I'll go with an expensive linebacker, and that's Frankie Louvu from the go. Panthers. I don't know what the situation is going to be for the Chargers, um, how much they believe in Dayon Henley, Nick Neiman, how much they believe in Eric Hendricks, how much are these guys going to play? I don't know. But as I said, I watched a lot of Michigan, and it was apparent, sure, watching the defensive tackles, but also very apparent watching the linebackers play in particular. You have to have linebackers for Jesse Minter to just destroy protection calls by rushing the passer. I think this bears out with the, the Ravens as well, with like Patrick Queen. He rushed the eighth most times in the NFL last year. Um, Michael Barrett, uh, Junior Colson, the two Michigan linebackers, rushed over 100 times. I believe Michael Barrett was second in this class and pass rush win rate or pass rush grade. Like it is very important for this defense to be able to, to rush the passer from that B gap, from the A gap to put different pressures um, on the quarterback and on the offensive line and the protections. We saw that obviously with the, with the Ravens when they played the Chargers and what they were able to do there. And, and Luvu is someone who was number one in pass rush grade last year, eighth in pass rush win rate. I can barely say that sometimes. I think I got it that time. Um, and I just think that's so important for this defense. Again, a bit expensive. We'll see what the room looks like and and who they believe in and who they want to continue to work with um, as a starter in this game. But linebacker is so important. And again, one, you know, it's important, like with Eric Henry, with like Greg Roman, sure. 
But I also feel like there needs to be some sort of precedent to talk about like a linebacker getting this kind of money. And I think that we see with the Ravens sort of like running back, like they do want to invest in this position where it's considered, you know, not a premium position. Uh, the Ravens had no problem investing in linebacker, obviously a first rounder for Patrick Queen, yeah. but then they gave up two picks for Roquan Smith and gave him a, a five year, hundred million dollar contract. And that was important for yeah. their defense. That's, that's a big contract. And this is definitely not that Lubu is definitely not getting a five year, hundred million dollar contract, but it is important for this scheme to have linebackers, excuse me, who can blitz and put pressure on the line and the quarterbacks. And there is a precedent with the Ravens of them going out and spending this much money. So I, I think it is at least worth bringing up either Luvu or any other linebacker who can rush the passer. You could include Drew Tranquil with that as well, because he's very good at doing that. Um, because I think it's important for this scheme and there's a precedent there. Yeah. No, that's a good call. There's a lot of uh, the film community who really like Frankie Luvu. Um, and it, it is going to be interesting to see what happens at the linebacker position. You know, if the Chargers want to free up some extra cap space, you know, they could certainly cut Eric Kendricks. But maybe they want to keep Eric Kendricks to be that kind of mentor for the the next group of linebackers. So it is going to be interesting to see there. I, quickly, I, I do think the Chargers are going to be in the market for some kind of defensive back. Not an expensive one, but they have a lot of needs at defensive back. Really the only starters of like your, if you like have your, Course six defensive backs. I think you have Asante and you have Derwin, obviously, but I think the other spots are, are up for grabs right now. So I do think the Chargers could be in the market for maybe a slot corner, uh, maybe a free safety, you know, like a Deshaun Elliott or like a Jordan Fuller type of player. So I am curious to see what the avenues are for adding defensive backs because, like linebackers, like you look at the stuff that Michigan has done with Mike Samer still and Daxon Hill, like they need versatility at safety and it can't just be their <laughs> Yes, absolutely. I, I didn't have a particular name to bring up as like, this is the defensive back that I have to have, but I'm glad you brought it up because they could go with yeah. uh, Jordan Lewis, the slot cornerback for the Cowboys. They could go with Rocky Austin. They could go with Ronald Darby, the two former Ravens. They could go with Kenny Moore. I'm not saying that they're going to go out and get an elite great, defensive back the Chargers don't have the kind of money to go out and spend 20 million dollars on, on a defensive back but they just need bodies and they definitely need a veteran presence there uh, yep. maybe their first pick in the first round they trade back and take a corner it'd be great to have someone who's been there done that been in the league for a very long time who can really help guide that indiv individual not that Derwin can't not that Asante Samuel Jr. can't but there's something about those like seven eight nine year veterans that could be out there to help so any of these guys who have been there done that and maybe even understand the scheme, I think would be a really good call. Yeah, 100%. 100%. All right, guys, uh, that's going to do it for us today. Tyler, uh, any final thoughts before we head out? We are so close to free agency, man. Like the, the off season wins are almost here. I'm really excited. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have a ton of coverage for you guys on free agency week. Um, by the time this is out, Tyler and I will have an episode specifically about how the Chargers address cornerback uh, on our channel. So please go check that out. Uh, make sure to like, subscribe, comment, leave us a rating or review on the Chargers feeds. All that stuff uh, really does help us out. So we appreciate you there. Um, we'll, uh, that's going to do it for us today. We'll see you guys next week. And as always, hold up.